The views, information, or opinions expressed during the filming of this show are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Hillsong Channel or Hillsong Church. Why do we see ourselves the way we do? Culture often dictates that our worth, path, and identity are determined by our race, our gender, the things we've done, and the things that have been done to us. Projections of the lives of others and the state of our world saturate our news feeds, making it difficult to distinguish the real from the highlight reel. I'm Natalie Manuel Lee, and in this series, I'll be digging beneath the surface to uncover what it really means to be bold, transparent, and confront our shame. In this season, I'll be speaking with people at the top of their industry, from the realms of music, radio, politics, television, and philosophy, to find out how they navigate shame and translate their hardships into opportunities to refine themselves instead of define themselves. So, how do we rise above challenges to truly operate in our purpose and identity? True confidence is magnetic, drawing opportunity to the one who walks in it. Life can come with both accolade and shame, but for some, a sense of fulfillment is enduring regardless. I'm seeking to unpack the idea of confidence, where it comes from, and what it looks like in reality. How do we form a sustainable and unwavering sense of direction, despite opposing opinions from others? Can we strive for our dreams without allowing their fruition or failure to determine our happiness? And how does confidence, in its purest form, play out in our lives? In this episode, I went to the home of Nigerian-American actress and comedian, Yvonne Orji, perhaps best known for her role as Molly on HBO's Insecure. This Emmy-nominated actress has also taken the comedy circuit by storm is a podcaster and an author. Well known for her personal faith and convictions, I was curious to hear about how her sense of confidence formed. A lot of actors and actresses and comedians get way more no's than, it, than they do yeses. And I also want to unpack how she deals with disappointments and being in the public eye. She's practicing abstinence, uh, no sex before marriage, so I want to know, do people shame her for, you know, not being the culture norm, being from Nigeria and growing up in the United States, you know, how did she embrace both cultures and was it difficult, was it easy? She really went against the grain. She, she did the complete opposite of what was expected of her to do. I appreciate so much. Like, for real, for real, for real, for real. So is home Nigeria and America? It's both. Like, you know, I'm, I, I'm down the middle. Like, I say I'm Nigerian-American. How did you embrace the two different cultures? My parents would speak to us in our native language of, of Igbo. And they, they always wanted us to just be connected. And so we would go home every summer, you know, doing summer vacations and stay for three months. And I'm kind of like having the best of both worlds because America shaped me, but Nigerians raised me. And so there is this great amalgamation. Like, I'm both. Like, I can't separate. Nigeria gives me my drive. Nigeria gives me my pride, my energy. Like, it gives me a lot of things. America gives me opportunities to put all of those things into place. So, How was it growing up in America? It was cool because, like, I was with my, my, my siblings and I was with my family. And then growing up, I was bullied. So, like, that wasn't sexy, like, at all. What happened? It was just differences. You know, it was like, what, I came here in 89, and I had a very thick Nigerian accent. And so, you know, kids can, kids don't like different. And I was the kind of kid that was like, I'm sure we'd be great friends if you guys just got a chance to know me. And they were like, oh, we don't want to get to know you. <laughs> and so from third grade to eighth grade, I was bullied. And I just never understood, like, in my mind, like, I'm a very rational person. Like, I'm just like, this doesn't make sense. Like, I'm I'm a great human being. So it was just very interesting. I was by myself a lot, and I read a lot. 
And I would talk to myself a lot in the mirror, like, didn't know that's what actors do. Um, <laughs> now look. No idea, no clue that like God was probably preparing me to like memorize lines and just, you know, create characters. Um, at the time I was just like, man, I, I have no friends. It's just me by myself in this bathroom and this mirror. Your parents wanted you to be a doctor. As most Nigerian parents <laughs> want their kids, yes. And why is that? You know, I, I I joke when I say, for the most part, bragging rights. Uh, my daughter is a doctor. You know, like, it's like, it sounds great, you know. But at the same time, you know, if your daughter's a doctor or your son's a doctor, they'll never not have a job. You know, it's, it's like, we want we want to make sure that we can die in peace knowing that you're going to be well taken care of. You know, that's why, like, comedy is such a crapshoot. It's like, you... You want to be a jester. Like you want to tell jokes tell for a living. Tell me that moment. You <sighs> then pursued comedy. Yeah. And how did it all unfold? How did your parents take it? Uh, not well is the short answer. But I don't blame them because you had this daughter who, like National Honor Society, graduate of salutatorian, got into GW. You're like paying Boku money for her education. You sacrificed like your friends and family back home to bring her. Like it's like it made sense. I was doing all the things, and then one day it's, she's like, I actually want to tell jokes for a living. It's like. Uh -huh. You were doing the things that they wanted you to do yeah. to prepare. What? I was the good Nigerian girl. I was like, I was on track. You become a doctor at 26, married at 27, kids by 28. Like, that is the thing. And, like, in my gut, I was like, I don't know. But there was no backup plan. And then one day, one random day, I enter a pageant. It was the Miss Nigeria and America pageant. It's very specific. And part of the, the contest was that like, you had to have a talent. And I was like, Oh, I don't. I don't know what that is. I don't have one. Like where immigrants are not raised to have talents. That's the American way. I don't. I don't know. Like I. I make straight A's for a living. Is that a talent? But I don't know how to show that on stage. And um, they were like, "Well, everyone who competes has to have one." And I remember being like, "Ah, oh, man, God, this is a setup. Like I'm going to be made fun of again. Like I'm going to go back to being bullied again." Mm -hmm. um, help. And loudest day, I heard Holy Spirit say, "Do comedy." And I was like. What does that mean? You heard the Holy Spirit say, do comedy. Mm -hmm. Is it this daunting voice? Is, is it this soft voice? It is a voice that I know is not mine. You know, almost like your mom's voice, right? When you hear your mom, she doesn't have to be, she can be on the phone, she can be leaving a message. Like, you know that's your mom's voice because you're in tune with it. Like, you spend time with her. You have a relationship with her. So when you spend time with God and you have a relationship, there will be things that come to you and you're like, I know, I didn't think about that. Like, and there's no one else but, like, Jesus. Like, there was nothing in me that was like, I should do comedy for, like, there, no. Access all your favorite preaching, worship, and shows on demand. This is incredible. Hillsong Channel now. Subscribe today. Oh, yeah. Whether we have migrated to a completely new culture or just find ourselves a bit at odds with those around us, most of us will face ill-fitting expectations at some point. And how do we handle the shame that comes with that? The weight and consequence of disappointing others can impact our confidence, and in turn, our purpose and sense of self. I say like Americans have the luxury of like dreaming big dreams, yeah. like, cause you're here and it's like, I just want to do what makes me happy. I'm like, oh, that is an amazing privilege. <laughs> <laughs> because but that's true. I was like, I can't just do what makes me happy. I'm like, I gotta do what makes me the orgy last name, the village that I come from. What will make everyone like truly be proud? Like she has done it, you know. And so, yeah, I don't have the luxury of just like thinking for myself. And like, you know, a lot of what I had to do in the initial stages of this dream was like, hey, mom and dad. Like, I had to learn to be selfish. Like, I had to learn like. It's going to look like I don't care about anybody, but like I care more about God than anybody. So let me do this, but I feel like it'll be a win for everybody. That's tough though. And it's rough. Yeah. How did you tell your parents? After grad school, I still didn't go to med school. I went to work in Liberia after the war because I was like, oh, post-conflict country? It's so much better than like confessing to my parents that I don't want to be a doctor. Yeah. So I like evaded the conversation again for like another six months and then finally there was a recession in America in 2009. And I was like, well, 
nobody else has a job, so I'll just be one of the millions of Americans that are unemployed, but I'll be following the stream. And I remember my mom immediately started crying because it was just like, she's serious. She's like leaving. And my dad was furious. Like, so you were never comedic no, when you were younger? No. You were I wasn't, not this person when you were younger? I wasn't given the opportunity to be this mm. person when I was younger because I didn't have friends. I didn't have anyone to showcase if this was in me. Like, I'm pretty sure this was in me, but, like, it was dormant because there was no outlet for it. I just remember admiring my dad holding court. My father, he's a chief, he holds the chief title. And whenever his friends would come over, it would be like, you know, the, everyone telling jokes and these big, like, like boisterous men, like laughing from their bellies. And I was like, that's pretty cool. Like whatever that is, like I wanna be free enough to like be that. Not like I wanna be the one to make people laugh. I just wanna be free enough and secure and confident enough that I have friends that I can laugh with mm -hmm. and there is something about watching male energy and just the confidence they have mm -hmm. in just being that I was like that is so freeing liberating and when I did do comedy I channeled like my older brothers I channeled that that thing that I saw from my dad and was like yes I'm gonna I'm gonna dominate this, you know, this space that's very male dominated. I'm gonna do it like them, but also like me. But who am I? Because I'm still trying to figure out who I am. Yvonne did establish the confidence as a young Nigerian American woman to enter into the freedom of carving out her own path. After her unorthodox entry into the world of comedy, she navigated both disappointment and opportunity to find herself very much in the public eye and on the way to seeing many of her ambitions fulfilled. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, the homie. Yvonne hey. Orgy, welcome back. Thank you all, this feels love. The <laughs> last time we seen you, uh, well I seen you, was uh, Chris Rock show. Yes. Oh, I you saw killed her. it. Yep. Thank you. Now, let's talk, talk about that a little bit. How was going on tour and doing them and doing them shows, huge arenas? It was bananas. Because, you know, I grew up watching Chris. I, mm -hmm. I, I told him when I first met him, I was like, I still have your jokes on deck. And so for him to trust me enough with this gift to be like, hey, just come open up. And I was like, has he seen me? Has Like, did he watch that? Like, I'm like, is there a tape of me? And he was just like, you're funny. Was it a lot of pressure? I mean, for me, because it's like, that's your idol. You want to yeah. do good. Um, and just, but I think he just believed in me so much. It's like, you know, when somebody, when, when you know you got it and then somebody else believes in you, it's just like, then what you worried about. As an actress, you get way more no's than mm -hmm. you do yeses. How do you not allow that to label you as being rejected? I hate no's. Like, I hate, like, I hate no's in every aspect of the word. Like, I hate being told, oh no, you can't do that. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. Like, I don't, like, is it that I really can't do it? Or that like, it hasn't been done, so you don't know that I can do it? It's impossible for it to be, like, I don't, like, I don't know where this no is coming from, so I can't accept it. Um, that's just like in life. So I always push past the no. But as an actress, sometimes rejection is the best thing that can happen to you. And also, you learn quickly if I gave it my best and if I did my all, then this is not about me. When you make it about you, then it, it, it's like it's an inward, downward spiral. How do you deal with the nose when it is essentially on you? If you did make a mistake mm -hmm. or there was a regret? Well, I think there's something to learn in that too. You know, there's something to learn in like, okay, well, was I as prepared as I should have been? We all have a bad day. Like, it's like, we have to be kinder to ourselves too. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of times we make it so detrimental. Yeah. Like there's no coming back from it. Like, oh God, I made that one mistake. Like if I ever see them again, like it'll never, it's like, no one's thinking about you that much. Like, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> no one's you're, 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 you're thinking about it as like, like, as in like, this is the worst thing that'll ever, 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 ever happen to me. And like, I can't bounce back from that. But then it's like, if I have an opportunity to do better, I will be more prepared. If I have an opportunity to apologize, I will do that. But like, I auditioned for Insecure five times. Five times? Five times. Wait. Why five times? Did you get no like the third time? I was a no name nobody. Like five, I had to start from like first audition, second audition. Now bring in the troops and bring in the, you know, EPs and okay, now bring in the suits. And so it was just like, I had to continue being consistent. And our showrunner said, you didn't have the best first audition. He's like, there was somebody else 
that did a much better job than you did. But you kept coming back and you consistently improved. So yeah, like the first time it was like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. I'm like, oh God, like what are we doing? And I could have ruined it, but it was just like, okay, well God, as long as they keep come, bring them back here, let me, let, me, let me keep getting better, okay? Let me not rest on my laurels. Let me not think I got it, you know, even when I think I got it. And it was that never settling or never just coasting that helped me win. The tension between possessing the confidence to stop our flaws from defining us and having the humility to work on those very same flaws is something I'm encountering a lot. Self-awareness and reflection are essential tools to have in our kit, but rejection in life isn't always something we can control, and it can have devastating effects on our confidence. I wanted to dig deeper into how Yvonne has processed these things. When you get those no's, mm -hmm. you talked about earlier that you got bullied when you were younger. Yeah. Does it ever take you back? For sure. Mm. Therapy really helps me understand like, hey, 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 you're reacting as if you did when you were eight years old, but that's not the same thing that's presenting itself. I have to realize like I'm a new person with new information, with new motives and with new players. Mm. So play accordingly. Yeah. Why do you feel like the culture puts such shame on therapy, getting help. Because it's, you know, we, especially people of color, you know, we're the strong ones. You right. know, like, we, slavery happened and it's like, you know, we, we got through it. Then, you know, everything else that happened, we got through that. It's like, if we could get through X, Y, and Z, if we could get through colonization, if we can get through all of this, then it's like, we're good. But it's like, nah, we weren't supposed to get through all those things. <laughs> those things are hard. And those things are like leaving legacies and generational curses that we would like to throw off. So just because you were strong enough to endure it doesn't mean that it was right. Doesn't mean that like you should still be carrying it on your back because it's a heavy load. The more people normalize like, hey, we need we need someone that's a neutral party that is not just going to be our yes, yes friend or, you know, judge us, but just help us push past these, these things that I may not even be able to articulate because I haven't had the space. In my opinion, our culture does a great job of putting shame on it because we think we're always good. Or there's this thing of like, if you need, like if you go to therapy, it's like, oh, cause you need it. Like we all need it. Like mm -hmm. did, were, were you born? Like you have tried, like even if you were raised in a beautiful family and it's like, it never saw your parents fight, you don't have the tools now to deal with people who didn't grow up like you. Like it doesn't mean like something's wrong with you. It means that like you're trying to make more things right about you than are wrong about you. What would you tell someone that is feeling shameful because of the mistakes and the failures and the regrets? The thing about it is like as human beings, we we hold on to those feelings because those are blankets. Those are the blankets we use to cloak ourselves to like stay low, to stay down. God says, I come so that you may have life and life more abundantly. Shame, guilt, and all these things, those are not helping you have the more abundant life. Shame and guilt help you to steal, kill, and destroy your joy, your purpose, your your destiny. So it's like, it's not to say that we're not going to deal with those things, that those things don't have their consequences, but it's like, how long, how long, how long is long enough? Like, how long are you going, like, forever? Are you going to go through the rest of your life with this, like, scarlet letter or this one thing you did one time, like, forever? Mm -hmm. Like, when, when do you want to let go of that? As long as you're still believing that God can't do more in your life, even through a bad season, you know, then you're not going to inherit what already had your name on it. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people that have, that God has put their name on an amazing inheritance that they're never gonna cash in on. Confidence and ambition require grit and commitment. And what I admire in Yvonne is that she never takes the easy way out. And while she holds a strong sense of self and purpose, her convictions and commitment are what set her apart. It's funny because people see me and almost think like I'm an anomaly, but I'm like, I'm only me because I'm like, I saw fly Christians who were like, I love Jesus and Louboutins. And you're like, what? You know, like, or like, you know, I you believe in integrity and character, but at the same time, like, I'm gonna be a boss chick. And so it's just like, wait, the, the, they can coexist? Like, this is how you actually do get ahead? Just loving God, loving people, and doing what's right? Okay, that's sexy. You know, like, that is sexy. Not like, you know, 
trying to backbite or gossip or climb over somebody, you know, in a, in a way that's not fruitful or fortuitous for everybody. And so I was able to really see people who made their Christian walk sexy in a positive way. We hope you're enjoying this episode. Watch ad free on Hillsong Channel Now. You have made a decision yeah. to wait to have sex before you're married. Yes. You have such strong convictions. Yeah. How do you not let people around you feel ashamed that maybe they're not abiding by your convictions? For me, it's my choice. I don't allow people to shame me for my decision and the same way I don't allow I don't allow myself to shame other people because are there any guarantees? No. Okay, great. So then you can't be, you can't tell me that like me not doing it is better or worse because it's like there are no guarantees either way. So my thing is always like, can you look in the mirror? Can you be happy with your decision? Can you feel like the love and grace of God on your decision? Then turn up because I'm not here to say my way is better or your way is better or whatever. It's like, and are you happy with your way? I am. I am. Like, honestly, like to like, I am. <laughs> like, Cause when I think about like heartbreak, when I think about like the relationships I've been in, when I think about just everything. I'm just so grateful and glad that I'm like, man, I'm, I'm glad that this person doesn't have that piece of me with them. So it's just like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm really glad. Like, I'm glad, like, even in the midst of the hurt, I can be like, but it's okay, girl. Like, you gonna make it. Yeah. If you're listening and you're like, oh man, another Valentine's Day, or like, I, like, I just broke up with my significant other or whatever. Hey, hey, listen, you are Gucci. You do your work. You do your self-reflection. Yep. You take the necessary steps to make you the best version of you so that when the, the next one who will be the best one comes, next one will you be the best one. don't have all this baggage. You're so confident. Do you ever question yourself or God? I question myself a lot. I'm actually learning to trust my gut more because my gut hasn't failed me. But then sometimes I betray myself because I'm trying to be a team player. I'm trying to, you know, like make people feel more comfortable by not seeming so confident. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because I don't want I don't want my confidence to put people off. It's like this this appeasing thing. But like again, that's like trauma from being bullied. It's like you're trying to be a people pleaser. You're trying to be more accommodating. So like people will like you. And but it's like people will like you more when they respect you. So mm -hmm. like let's not try to be like let's try to be respected. You yeah. know. And if you're if you're doing good enough, and if you're doing excellent work, and if you're being a person of integrity it'll be fine. Like they'll respect you and they'll like you. And if they don't like they're lost. But what was the turning point from being bullied mm -hmm. to this confidence? What happened in the middle? When you are on a journey that feels so isolating, mm -hmm. like my parents didn't understand what I was doing. I low key didn't understand what the heck I was doing. I was just blindly trusting. It was like the, the longest trust fall ever. When you change the mindset from like, what was me and why is this happening to me? And like, everything's trash to being like, you know what? Even in the midst of this, like, what's the way out? Like, mm. how, we, how, we gonna, how we gonna turn this L into a W? Okay, I know it's, it's gonna come full circle one way or another. It will. And I'm ready for it. Like, and it's just like- That's so difficult sometimes. Yeah, but that's actually what faith is. That's what faith requires. Why are we going to tiptoe around this thing we say we believe in? I remember specifically God saying, one day either you're gonna trust me or you're not. And I remember being like, well then what the heck is the, the point of all these Bible studies? What the heck is the point of these Bible reading plans? What the heck is the point of Sunday morning? What the heck is the point of worship if we're not going to like give him the liberty to, to be God in our lives? And that is difficult, but sounds like it's the best thing that's ever happened to you. It's difficult because we wanna know how everything works. Yeah. And it's like, that's the opposite of faith. Like, faith requires you to be like, I don't know how this is going to work out, but like, but I do know you and your MO is pretty legit. Is that how you deal with disappointments in the public eye? Yeah, it is. It's how I have to deal with everything. And it doesn't mean that the disappointments don't come. It doesn't mean that I have to keep reminding myself of that, right? You know, it's not like a Band-Aid to like suppress pain or anything like that. But it is like, God, this pain is real in this moment. But like, I know your MO. What does he do with that pain? He turns it around for your good. Some of the things that I thought were the hardest things to ever go through, those were the things that solidified in me undoubtedly, unashamedly, unabashedly. Like, I know he can do it because those painful moments had to be turned into like, oh, you know what? 
I'll never know everything about how you work, but I do know that you work. Do you feel like you only got to this point now because you've experienced it? Yeah, I've seen too much. Like, I, like, like people are like, how can you be so sure? I've seen too much. I don't know how he's going to do anything. I don't know where my husband's going to come from. I don't know where my next deal is going to come from. But like, it has to happen. We all know there's difficulties that come in the valleys of rejection and failure. But we sometimes fail to foresee is the challenges a mountaintop brings. Having a confident faith and understanding of your worth make the way for fulfilled dreams. But do fulfilled dreams equate to a fulfilled soul? I was interested to get to the bottom of where lasting joy comes from for Yvonne. Are you happy? I'm getting back to it. There was a there was a moment where it felt like, dang, like all the dreams that I thought were big and audacious and was just like, when will this ever happen? They're all happening. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, I got to dream new dreams. But then it's like, I don't know. I don't know what those are. Success can be a good thing and a bad thing. A good thing because like you're successful and then a bad thing because then it's like you have to rely not on what you're able to do in your own strength now because of your success, but go back to the basics and rely on that thing that you had to rely on mm -hmm. when you weren't successful. Yeah. And when your options grow, it's kind of like, it's easy to be a virgin when like nobody wants you, when ain't nobody checking for you, when you're like, you're not cute. Mm -hmm. uh, but when like you pop in, it's like, huh. it's cool to be this thing when like no one's checking for you when like there's nothing to lose. But what happens when there's something to lose? Like now you have stuff on the table. What's the future look like for you? Hopefully bright. <laughs> like, I mean, I can't, I'm not in it, but I'm like, if this is what the past and present has looked like, then the future should be better than this. Cause we go from grace to grace and glory to glory. So I just hope like I'm still enjoying the journey, you know, because sometimes you get the dream, you get the thing that you prayed for but then you don't have the joy that should come with it. And that, I feel like that sucks the success out of it all. Mm. So I'm finding my happiness going back to the basics of like, God, this is all great. This is all dope. But like, what are we doing? Are we good? Yeah. The same God that brought this, if it all goes away, he can bring it again yeah. and better. So do you feel like that's just indicative of your dreams and the things that you have are not really your identity. I can't stress enough that I really had a good foundation of what walking by faith really means. Yeah. My pastor would say, do the blessings of God have you or do you have them? Mm. It's this like motive check. Like the blessings are gonna come, but, but can God trust you with them? Like, do they have you? If he asks you to risk it all, would you? Yeah. And at what point do you trust that even if I risk it all, the same God that brought it to me when I wasn't asking for it could bring it back again because I gave it to him? We look to the left and look to the right for things to define us and our confidence to be in everything else, but in, in ourselves and in, you know, obviously in God. I think if we all have that perspective in life, we wouldn't fear anything. That spoke to me. When you truly know who you are, not a lot of things can rock you. She's confident and, and that's why I kept asking her, how do you have all this confidence and you were bullied? Because that's challenging. That's challenging to not let that stuff that happened to you in your past make you feel less than. As she said, she still struggles, but at the base of every day, she's confident and it's admirable. In the next episode, I sit down with influential and controversial media personality, Charlemagne the God. In the iHeartRadio studios, we take time out to unpack his troubled past, the climate of cancel culture, shaming others, and mental health. Join us as we explore the vital importance of growth. If you've been affected by the subject matter in this episode, please contact a qualified healthcare professional in your area. Or go to hillsongchannel.com/help. 
Shame will tell you that you are what you've done. I've discovered on this journey that shame has robbed a lot of people knowing who they really are. During that time, did you engage in the backlash? I just resorted to creating so many distractions in my life that I didn't deal with what was happening. We're in these verbally abusive relationships with our smartphones. You gotta ask yourself why, right? It was always somebody saying to me, I was praying you died this morning. It was kind of like a frat party. The fans, the girls, in front of thousands of people. But I was a shell inside. One way to marginalize black people was to convince them that what they're saying isn't true. That we've had it just the same. Can we have these conversations and it is unifying? I think it is uncovering the darkness of what this country has been to so many. Why do you think that people don't want to confront their past? Everybody wants to feel good. I will take this to make me feel good. It's killing us. And I was just at rock bottom, so rock bottom that I was suicidal. I had to just acknowledge some of the things that I've done. Some of the things that I thought were the hardest things to ever go through, those were the things that solidified in me, try me and try God. There is so much hope and encouragement given when you're transparent with your story. People, they don't want to see the perfect story. You've got to refuse to allow yourself to be defined by your mistakes. You can't do anything to change the past, but you can change your perspective of the past. The beauty is, is we're discovering how to dismantle shame robbing us of our full potential. 